I'm going to start the broadcast now. So off we go. Thank you for those who are just uh, joining us. I'm just going to give it another moment for uh, the rest of the guests to, to come in. So good afternoon, everybody, um, and welcome to the virtual Eccle Center for American Studies. Um, it normally looks a bit more professional and not quite so much like my spare room, but we all we all know why <laughs> why we are spending a lot of time in our spare rooms. Um, so welcome um, to this very special event, our American Politics Colloquium. Uh, we organise this event every year in collaboration with our colleagues at the American Politics Group uh, of the Political Studies Association. So um, I'm going to hand over shortly to, um, to my colleagues to explain a little bit about uh, their, their programming today, their vision for, for the, the APG and why, they've, why we, we do events such as these. Um, so the, as you will hopefully know, the programme today is in two halves. So we're going to have um, a plenary lecture and discussion first, and we have a half hour break. And then we have our um, former members of Congress, George Holding and Loretta Sanchez, who are joining us. Um, and they are uh, joining us through the Eccle Center's uh, longstanding uh, partnership with the US Association of Former Members of Congress. So I just want to say a big thank you to our colleagues there, to Sharon and Haley and the rest of the team for helping uh, bring us George and Loretta, um, even in only virtual form. So I'm going to uh, hand over now uh, to Andy Rowe from the APG, who's just going to say a few words of welcome, and then we will uh, we will get on with the with the session. So thank you. Over to you, Andy. Thanks very much, Cara. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrew Rowe. I'm uh, co-chair of the American Politics Group, which is a specialist uh, subgroup of the Political Studies Association. Uh, this is our annual uh, colloquium, one of two big events we put on each year, our other one being a three-day residential conference in January. Of course, we won't be doing that this year, but we'll be doing that online and we'll be sending details out uh, fairly shortly on that. Um, we, uh, I'd like to thank um, Cara uh, for hosting this event, both as uh, in her role as uh, acting uh, head of the Eccles Centre at the British Library, but also as a role of chair of the British Association of American Studies. She's juggling so many chainsaws and doing it absolutely fantastically. It's, it's amazing. And we genuinely could not have put on this event today if it wasn't for Cara's uh, skill set, um, because myself uh, uh, and my co-chair, Phil, will acknowledge that, you know, our uh, uh, Zoom skills are perhaps not uh, quite up to the uh, required standards. So, Cara, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Uh, welcome to uh, old APG hands. Um, we would normally be shaking hands and saying hello and give each other hugs in the British Library at this moment, but it's uh, still great to have you here, even though we can't uh, make physical contact. But also, Welcome to anyone new to the APG. Um, we are really pleased that you've joined this uh, webinar and hopefully we will see you at future APG, APG events in person. So I really look forward uh, to that. I'm gonna hand over now to Dr. Laura Smith, who in turn is going to introduce our first session and our esteemed speaker. So Laura, over to you. Thank you so much, Andy. I'm Laura Smith coming at you today from Oxford University. It's an absolute honor and pleasure to introduce Candace Nelson, a professor in the Department of Government and Academic Director of Campaign Management Institute. She's an expert on presidential congressional elections and also studies voting behavior, campaign finance and campaign finance reform. Her most recent book is Campaigns and Elections American Style in its fifth edition. And with that, I hand over to Professor Nelson. Thank you, Dr. Smith, very much. I'd also like to thank uh, Dr. Philip Davies and Dr. Andrew Rowe, the co-chairs of the American Politics Group, uh, for their very kind invitation to speak to you today. 
and um, Dr. Cara Rodway and the Eccles Center for American Studies at the British Library for hosting this event. Okay, now the technology part where I try and share my screen. Okay, can everyone see? Okay. Um, um, going into the election, probably the presidential election, probably in the month or so, there were two main narratives about what might happen. One was that there would be what was being called a blue wave, that Joe Biden would win the popular vote pretty uh, successfully, that he would win the electoral college vote pretty successfully, that Democrats would pick up the Senate um, and that they would pick up seats in the House of Representatives. So that was one narrative. The second narrative was that Joe Biden would win the popular vote, but Donald Trump would eke out a victory in the Electoral College, uh, much as he did in 2016. In practice, neither of those uh, narratives turned out to be accurate. This is the presidential election outcome in the Electoral College. Joe Biden currently has 290 Electoral College votes. Uh, there were two states that were out there that were th where he was leading. One was Arizona, which was officially called yesterday. President Trump has 217 Electoral College votes. It's expected when all is said and done that President Biden will have 306 Electoral College votes. There is a recount going on in Georgia. Um, Biden is ahead in that recount. It's a hand recount. And so it probably won't end until sometime late next week, but it's expected that he will end up with 306 electoral college votes, which is uh, ironically the number of votes that uh, President Trump had four years ago. Trump is expected to end up with 232 electoral college votes. North Carolina still has not been called. They have an extended period to actually count their votes, but that's the expectation about where we're going to end up. It's proje projected that turnout in this election will be 66.3%. That will be the highest turnout in presidential elections since 1908. Biden currently has 77 million votes and that number is going up every day as votes are still being counted. Trump is at 72 million votes. So let's talk a little bit about the electoral college results. Biden was able to rebuild, if you will, what was being called the blue wall, which is Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. Those were the three seats in those are the three states in 2016 that Donald Trump won and really gave him the election. Biden also won in Arizona and is likely to win in Georgia. So he expanded, not only did he rebuild the blue wall, but he expanded the democratic success into states in the South and the Southwest where Democrats, at least in recent times had not been successful. However, Trump held on in Ohio and Iowa. Biden campaigned in both of those states. He also won North Carolina, or is likely to, uh, which has gone back and forth between Democrats and Republicans over the last several decades. He won Florida, which um, both Biden and Trump campaigned in Florida. And he won Texas. And there was some speculation that Biden might have a shot in Texas. Texas, like Arizona and Georgia, is changing demographically. Um, but in the end, Trump ended up winning. Let's talk a little bit about the exit polls. Biden won the youngest age group. Almost two thirds of them voted for him. 52% uh, of those 30 to 45 voted for him. Uh, those 45 to 64 voted for him. And of those 65 or older, Trump did win a bare majority of them, but it, he won fewer of those votes than he won in 2016. Trump won a majority of whites. 
Biden won a majority of Blacks, Latinos, and Asians. But please note that Trump won 32%, almost a third of Latinos. And this is a demographic group that is that sh should be supporting Democrats, but isn't in the numbers that many Democrats think it should be. And part of that is because there's sometimes a tendency to think of Latinos as a monolithic group, and they are not. Latinos in Florida, for example, are quite different than Latinos in Arizona. And there is speculation that one reason that Trump did win in Florida was because he did very well in South Florida, in Miami-Dade country, among Cuban Americans and Puerto Ricans. Uh, and so Latinos in Arizona tend to be uh, more Hispanic uh, than Latinos in Florida. So I think that's something that Democrats are gonna have to think about as they're going forward, as to how to, how to more successfully reach out to Latino voters. In terms of gender, males were pretty split between Biden and Trump. But we saw, uh, again, as we have in other elections, um, a pretty strong uh, gender gap in terms of females supporting Democratic candidates, in this case, Biden. Among white voters with college degrees, the vote was pretty split between Biden and Trump. But among white voters with no college degrees, Trump got um, 64%. And this is really his base. Um, we talk about who his, who his base is. And this is that white, white voters with no college degrees. It was the same thing in 2016. And he did um, pretty much as well with that group this time. I wanna talk a little bit about what the issues were in this election. And I think it gets to the messaging of the two campaigns. Shortly after Memorial Day, end of May, beginning of June, Trump started talking again about the economy. The economy was the issue that he wanted to run on. And if we go back to the beginning of 2020, the economy of the United States was quite strong. Then came the coronavirus. Businesses started to shut down, the country shut down pretty much between March and April and then started to reopen again in May. And Trump kept talking about the economy throughout the summer and throughout the fall. And there was some criticism of him for focusing on the economy rather than focusing on the pandemic. As you can see, uh, those who thought that the econ economy was excellent or good, and that was about 48% of voters, Trump got three quarters of them. Of those who caught, thought the economy was not good or poor, which was about 50%, so the, so the Public opinion was pretty split among voters. Biden got 81% of them. When voters were asked what was the most important issue, uh, the top five issues were, as you can see, racial inequality, coronavirus, the economy, crime and safety, and healthcare policy. 35% said the most important issue in their vote was the economy. And of those, Trump got eight out of 10. 20% said that racial inequality was important and Biden got an overwhelming number of those. 10% said the coronavirus was the most important issue. And again, Biden got a strong majority of those. Among those who said crime and safety was the most important issue, which was only 11%, Again, Trump got 71%. And that was sort of his second issue that he talked about. He talked about you know, some of the racial unrest that we had in the United States. Uh, he was gonna protect suburban women in their neighborhoods. And then healthcare policy, um, Biden got 63% of those. So I would suggest that each candidate was successful in getting their messages out there. Biden talked about racial inequality and the coronavirus and some about healthcare policy. And he won a majority or more of those voters. But of those who thought the economy and crime and safety were most important, which was the issues that Trump was supporting, he won a majority of those voters. And again, this is just another way to look at that, which is more important to do now, contain the coronavirus, which was Biden's argument, 
80% voted for him. We build the economy, 76% voted for President Trump. Voters were also asked which candidate quality mattered most. And you can see the four across the screen. 32% said the candidate quality that was the most important was is a strong leader. And again, Trump got 71% of those. Uh, can you unite the country? Biden got 76%, cares about people like me, Biden got 50%, has good judgment, Biden got 60%. But I would suggest if you put together Trump's message on the economy and he was the one to lead the country back into a strong economy, that that message got out and resonated um, with American voters. And then this, um, I think, I just th think this is an interesting uh, result. Um, of those who decided when they were gonna cast, who they were gonna vote for in the election, almost three quarters of those who voted decided before September. Only 5% decided in the last few days or the last week. 8% in October and 11% in September. So again, you had three quarters of those who voted in this election deciding before September, before the debates, before we, we talk as political scientists is the general election really starts in September. And yet we had three quarters of the, those who voted making up their mind before that. So in terms of my initial comment about what the two narratives were, um, like I said, I don't think either narrative played out. Trump didn't win the electoral college, but he got so far over 72 million votes, almost half of the country who voted, voted for him. Um, and I think I, his economic message got out there. Biden won the electoral college but he didn't win some states that he thought he might. He didn't do as well as in the Midwest, in Ohio and Iowa, as he thought he might. He did win Arizona and likely will win Georgia, but he didn't win in Texas. He didn't win in Florida. He didn't win in North Carolina. So it wasn't the blue wave, at least at the presidential level, that we thought it might be. So let's talk about the Senate and House races. The Democrats picked up two seats, uh, one in Colorado, Cory Gardner was the incumbent. He was running against um, John Hickenlooper, the former governor of Colorado. Gardner very much tied himself to Trump. Colorado was a red state several years ago, then it turned purple, now it's a pretty blue state. And Gardner, as did other Republican incumbents, made his choice to run with Trump and it didn't pay off for him. Mark Kelly won in Arizona, defeating Martha McSally, who was appointed, this is the, the McCain seat. Um, Governor Ducey appointed uh, McSally to that uh, seat and she, she had lost in 2018 um, when she ran and then she was appointed to the seat and then um, she lost. This wasn't a real surprise. Mark Kelly was ahead for most of the election. It tightened a little bit at the end and he also outraised her. Republicans um, won in Alabama. This has been, that had been a democratic seat. Uh, Doug Jones had won in a special election in 2017 when Jeff Sessions was appointed attorney general. This is, Alabama is a very red state. This was not a surprise. Um, the only reason Doug Jones won in um, 2017 is he was running against Roy Moore who had some pretty serious ethical allegations against him. Uh, Jamie Harrison, who was running uh, against uh, Lindsey Graham in South Carolina, lost. Harrison raised $85 million, which is the most money that's ever been raised uh, in a Senate race. But, and he ran uh, against, um, Lindsey Graham basically on the message that Graham had been a hypocrite because he had not supported Trump initially in 2016 and then had flipped and came around to be one of Trump's most loyal supporters in the, in the Senate. Um, 
And also because uh, Graham has said that he would not condone holding um, a, a nomination for Supreme Court justice uh, in an election year. And then he actually chaired the committee that did just that. Uh, in North Carolina, Cal Cunningham was running against Tom Tillis. Tom Tillis again uh, aligned himself with Trump. Uh, Cunningham had some personal ethical issues, um, but he ended up losing to Tillis. And then in Maine, which was one of the most interesting races, Susan Collins was running against Sarah Gideon. This was a seat that Democrats thought they were going to win. Ever since Susan Collins voted for um, Brent Kavanaugh when, as a Supreme Court nominee, um, the, the Democrats really had their sights on this race. Collins ended up winning by 7%. So the Democrats didn't win, do as well as they thought they would. They thought they would pick up Colorado and Arizona, which they did. They expected to lose Alabama, but they thought they had real pickup chances in South Carolina, North Carolina, and Maine. So they ended up really only winning, uh, picking up a net of one seat. Which brings us to Georgia. In Georgia, if you don't get 50% plus one of the vote, the election goes to a runoff. At the Campaign Management Institute, we talk about, you know, what is a win number? And it's 50% plus one, though we encourage our students to try and shoot for 51 or 52% just to be on the safe side. And George, in Georgia, to avoid a runoff, the number really is 50% plus one vote. Um, Kelly Loeffler is the incumbent. Um, she was appointed uh, almost a year ago when Johnny Isaacson uh, resigned due to health reasons. Raphael Warnock is um, running against her. Loeffler had a pretty, in Georgia, it's, it's what's called a jungle primary. So you have to get, to win, you have to get outright 50% plus one of the vote. Um, there were a lot of candidates running on the Republican side. Warnock pretty much consolidated the uh, support on the Democratic side, but he will face, uh, they will face off on January 5th. David Perdue is the incumbent. He's running against John Ossoff. Ossoff ran in a special election in 2017 for a congressional seat. He got the most number of votes, um, but again, he didn't get to 50% plus one and he lost in the runoff. If the Democrats win both of these seats, they will control the Senate because it will be 50-50 and um, Vice President-elect Kamala Harris will be the deciding vote. If they lose, lose either of them, then Republicans will retain control of the Senate. So again, the Democrats had hoped that they would you know, win, win um, control of the, of the Senate and that has now come down to um, the special election. In the House, um, the Democrats currently have 218 seats, the Republicans 202. There are 15 states as of yesterday that had not yet been called. This will be the closest um, margin that the majority party ha has had in the House in several decades. The Democrats are expected to retain control of the House. Um, it, it's not a question of them losing control, but this will be, a, this is very close and it has implications for 2022. Uh, I know it's hard to think that we're starting to think about 2022 already, but as you know, the party that controls the presidency, usually, at least in modern times, uh, with two exceptions, loses the House in at least the first off-year election. So the Democrats have some work to do if they're gonna retain the House in 2022. Kevin McCarthy, uh, the Republican leader, has already started to talk about flipping the House in, 20, in, in 2022. And given these numbers, that's probably not an unrealistic expectation. And finally, the state legislatures. While the Democrats were winning the presidency in 2008 and 2012, the Republicans were doing a very good job of winning the state legislatures. In 2016, the Democrats put together a um, 
commission led by former Attorney General Eric Holder to try and really focus on the state legislatures, flipping some of those legislatures to be in a position for redistricting in um, following this election going into 2022. There was very little change. And it, since there was change, um, it went in the direction not favoring the Democrats. New Hampshire flipped uh, its legislature from Democrat to Republican. This is the least change in state legislature since 1944. So this has real implications for redistricting. The Republicans control more state legislatures than they do, than do Democrats. And so they will have an advantage in drawing uh, the redistricting, redistricting lines going into 19, uh, going into 2022. With that, I am happy to take comments and questions. Thank you so much, Professor Nelson, for that fascinating talk. There's a lot for us to dig into there. If I could just take this opportunity to remind everyone, if you have a question, please use the Q&A function. We've already received some questions there. If you remember to put your name as well, so then I can call on you uh, and you can unmute yourself uh, and, and ask your question. I'm just going to take this moment to use the chair's prerogative and uh, have the opening salvo, if you will. Um, I've been really interested in how I've seen exit polls and I noticed in one of your slides how voters prioritize either coronavirus or the economy in the presidential election. And I'm really interested in that delineation. And I wonder whether perhaps that means that I know you mentioned that Biden and Trump were good at getting their messages out. But does that delineation perhaps suggest that Biden was less successful in making that connection between coronavirus and the economy is intertwined? Yes, I think that's true. And uh, I mean, Biden made the argument that in order to improve the economy, first we had to get control of the coronavirus. I think Trump was more successful in saying the economy was great. You know, before the virus, I'm the one who can continue to make it great. It was great through the first three years of my administration reelect me and we'll get things going. Uh, and didn't really talk about the coronavirus uh, because that was not a winning argument for him. Um, that, you know, the cases are going up in this country daily. Um, it's getting worse. And so his handling of the virus just wasn't working. He, you know, we've seen some um, hopeful signs about um, a, a vaccine uh, Trump tweeted earlier this week that this was some sort of conspir conspiracy theory about him, that the announcement of the, of the vaccine came a week after his election rather than a week before. He had hoped to have the virus uh, announcement prior to that. Uh, so it was not a winning argument for him, and he recognized that, and he talked about the economy. And I think, as I said in my talk, I think it did break through. That's great. All right, let's move it over to the audience. We have a question from Jonathan Parker. Jonathan Park, if you're out there, uh, we'd love you for to unmute yourself and uh, ask your question. Hello, thank you very much. Um, let's see, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, Perfectly. okay, great, I can't tell. Um, yes, uh, I'm very interested in the, the battle that's erupting amongst the, the Democrats in particular right now around why they did so poorly in the election overall. Um, and you have, of course, the, on the left saying we, they weren't true enough to the base, um, that Biden wasn't, wasn't saying things that were attractive to the left. Uh, and on the other hand, the, hand the, the moderates, particularly who lost seats, um, have argued that, that the base ran far to the, the left and that turned off the country. Which do you think is more compelling uh, an explanation? I, I, let me answer it this way. The Democrats have had an internal battle at least since 2015 between moderates and progressives. I mean, that was the argument in 2016 between Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton. That argument sort of continued early in the primaries. Um, you know, again, Bernie Sanders, uh, Joe Biden, and then Biden won all of a sudden. Uh, you know, he won South Carolina, then he ran one Super Tuesday and really ran the table. And so within a month, he went from maybe not a, a likely nominee to the nominee. And so the Democrats decided to sort of put their philosophical and issue agreements on hold to defeat Trump. That was their main goal. 
Bernie Sanders said about a month or so ago when asked, you know, you know that he had just he had he had several disagreements with um, Biden on issues, and Trump said um, Sanders said, "Well, that's true, but the most important thing is defeating Trump." But I will be talking to hopefully President Elect Biden on November fourth about our issue agenda. So I think that split in the in the party is still there. It's it's been unfortunate, as you suggest, over the past week or so, that some of the more progressives are saying that they were trying to be silenced by the moderates. Uh, Congresswoman Ocasio Cortez wrote. Uh, uh, an op-ed piece in the New York Times uh, pointing that out. Um, and so I think that's a that's going to be a real issue for President-elect Biden in terms of how he navigates his administration. And particularly if, um, given the close margins in the House, and if, if the Democrats don't pick up those two seats in Georgia, um, it, it's going to be a rough start for the for the Biden administration in terms of getting getting their message through, getting their issues through. That's great. Uh, next, we've got Laura Skillen. She's got a question about the age breakdown. Laura, if you're there, you can take it away. Yes, hello. Um, just a quick question. So regarding the age breakdown between people voting for Trump versus Biden, in 2016, we saw the eldest age groups actually vote against Trump, which is sort of hidden in this idea of an over 65 sort of monolithic block. And I was wondering if we saw similar trends here in terms of the eldest age groups going for Biden rather than Trump. I haven't seen a breakdown beyond 65 plus, so I can't answer that. Um, what, in terms of the pandemic, I mean, one of the explanations for why older people did not vote for Trump in the same numbers as they did in 2016 is because of the pandemic and because they may feel that they were most affected or most likely to be affected. And that was maybe a bigger issue for them um, than it was in 2016. That's great. Um, we're now gonna turn to Bill Barnard, who I believe has two questions, one of which has sparked a lot of conversation. So Bill Barnard, take it away. Uh, well, really, really the uh, second one is the more important one, I think. Uh, the first one is a little bit of what happened in South Florida with Puerto Ricans and whether or not they were democratic or not. We can talk about that later, but the more serious one isn't the simplest, perhaps overly simplistic explanation of Biden's success and the Republican success down ballot is both Trump and Biden did a good job of getting their base out, but moderate Republicans and many suburban voters couldn't stomach Trump and voted for Biden and then down ballot for Republicans. Yes, I think that's true. Um, and, and I think in some ways, 2016 was like 20, 2020 was like 2016. The Democrats assumed, because the Democrats just don't like Biden. They don't like his demeanor. They don't like the way he talks to people. And they think that others will respond in kind. And Trump's base doesn't. Uh, they will say, I don't like the, the way he tweets. I wish he wouldn't tweet so much. Yeah, I don't like what he says, but he's, he's getting the job done. And so for, the, for Democrats to think that, you know, Biden, Biden just doesn't have support out there is just not right. Uh, it's not correct. And, you know, there is a lot of finger pointing uh, about messaging, um, but, and, and now, I mean, you know, in my class, I, I asked them about a month ago, you know, you know, when they thought the 2024 election would start and who might be the candidates. And one student said, well, if Biden loses, I mean, if Trump loses, I'm sure he'll run again. And everyone just sort of laughed. Um, but now he is talking about running again in 2024. Uh, so that's going to complicate things um, for Republicans and Democrats in terms of, you know, what the election looks like. So I'm not sure if that answers your question. But. It's a good point. We live in uncertain times in so many ways. All right, uh, Polly Russell, if you're still out there, uh, would you like to ask your question? I think Polly's had to step out. 
Okay, all right, uh, I will take the bat for her then. Uh, Pauline Russell asks, could you talk about the chances of Democrats taking the two Senate seats in January in Georgia? I think they have a chance. Um, like I said, Asif ran in a special election, um, won, you know, didn't win 50% plus one, but he did get a plurality of the votes. And so he's been through a special election. It was one of the most expensive, expensive congressional races at the time. Um, Warnock is very respected. He's the senior minister of the Ebenezer Baptist Church, which is where John Lewis's funeral was held. Um, it's the church where Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, first spoke. So there's a lot of support, um, but it, it's, I mean, Georgia's an interesting state because Biden is likely gonna win it. Uh, Stacey Abrams, who ran for governor in 2018, came close to winning it. And since then, she has spent a lot of time and money organizing um, to really help bring out the Democratic vote. So I think both sides have a chance. Georgia, because it's a historically red state, historically Democratic state, but Democrats, because um, you know they've done well, Biden won, and it, it's going to be an ex extremely expensive race. I mean, both sides are going to really go all out in terms of trying to raise money um, because the, the control of the Senate is on the line, and that will be the message. Great, um, and this kind of follows on from the previous question that was asked, Peter Finn. Uh, if you'd like to ask your question. Uh, hi there, thanks. So can everyone hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, brilliant. Yeah. Um, so thanks for a great talk. Um, I just wondered, where does the Republican Party go now? Does it kind of distance itself from Trump? Does it kind of grin and bear him, like throwing like kind of fireworks in from the sidelines? Does it adopt another route? Thanks. That's a good question. I don't think the Republican Party knows because I don't think they know what Trump is going to do. If he decides he's not going to run for office and wants to explore media opportunities, there's talk about Trump TV, for example. Uh, he's very upset with Fox, who we thought Fox News, because he thought Fox was on his side, and then they turned around and called Arizona, uh, which upset him um, because they called Arizona before anybody else did. Um, so I don't think anyone knows. Um, I mean, we, we've seen the way this has played out in the last week. Uh, Trump has not conceded the election. He insists that the results uh, were illegal in some places. Most Republicans have gone along with that or at least been complicit in not challenging him on that. We've seen a few that have broken in the last couple of days. But if, if Trump wants to be a player, I think it's going to be really hard for Republicans to put together an alternative. There was, you know, the Lincoln Project in this election, which were Republicans who were not supportive of Trump. They raised and spent a fair amount of money. Um, but Trump has a solid base. He got over 72 million votes. Republicans are a little trepidatious about, about turning off that base. And it's interesting to see what happens to Republicans who were thinking about running. Um, Mike Pence, for one, what happens with Pence? Um, he's been loyal to Trump over the last eight years. I think he thought that loyalty would result in maybe Trump's base being transferred to him. But if Trump decides he wants to run, then what happens to Pence? Nikki Haley is another one who did, a, another person who did a really good job of trying to sort of straddle not being too supportive of the president, but not getting on his bad side either. What happens to her? There are a number of senators and governors who, who are thinking about running. Uh, what happens to them? So I think it really depends on what Trump decides to do. Such a good point, especially when uh, Haley and Pence have been sort of uh, alienated some people in their state politics. It's such a good point. All right, Tom Packer, uh, would you like to ask your question? Yeah. Uh, yes. Thank you very much. Um, I, um, I I suppose I have a two twofold question. One is, 
is there any evidence yet how people which issues people who swung to and from the Republican uh, or Democratic nominees, um, what issues they prioritize? Because my worry always with this kind of which issues most important to you is people just the large majority who always more or less always vote the same way, just repeat what the candidate's saying. So Trump says the economy is important. They say the economy of Biden says coronavirus is important. They say the coronavirus. Um, my other, my uh, other, other, um, yeah, uh, my, my other, uh, I think that'll do actually. Sorry, I can always ask my other question later. Yeah, I don't think we really know yet, you know, who the, the Trump 16, Biden 20 um, voters were. We just, we, I don't think we've gotten enough information yet to, to get into that. Okay, uh, Paul Action, would you like to ask your question? Yeah. Can All you right, hear me? I, oh, okay. are, you, are you there? Yeah, can you hear All me? Right. Yes. Ahead. Okay, that's good. Um, uh, my question really is about the um, anti-free trade policies. Um, and um, really the, <laughs> the discussion seems to be about what appeals in terms of issues to the US electorate. But I'm just more interested in the effectiveness of some of these uh, uh, Trump policies in actually ensuring that the uh, US economy is succeeding or has succeeded or is or is Trump just a, a layer on a long term successful uh, US um, economic high turn uh, and, and maybe what he's saying has absolutely nothing to do with anything. I know it sounds a bit skeptical, but that's what I am asking. Well, no, that's the argument Democrats make that, that they, when um, President Obama went into office, the economy was not in good shape, that over the eight years of his administration, the economy improved tremendously and Trump just inherited a strong economy. Uh, and maybe he did some things that built upon it, maybe he did some things that, that didn't build upon it. Uh, but that's not, that's not Trump's argument. Uh, his argument is, Things were in terrible shape, and he he took it over and made it better. So, all right, Stephen White, would you like to ask your question? Hi, um, yeah, hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hi. Um, I found this really fascinating, by the way. So well done. Thank you very much for doing this. Um, um, I've got just to give you a little bit of brief history. Why I'm so interested in this is that my my other half is is a Republican, um, and he, he also he actually voted by by absentee ballot um, this year. He previously voted for Trump, um, and this year he voted actually for Biden after growing quite disillusioned with Trump and the administration. Um, I just wanted to ask, because when you were talking about the Senate races, which we were also watching quite closely, um, one of the things that me and my other half discuss is that when we look at the Democrats and how they performed and how they didn't hit the expectations that they were expecting to, um, we both, both of us really feel that some of the issues kind of came down to, in particular, when you look at the Senate races like um, Lindsey Graham and when you look at also um, Susan Collins, is that their opponents very much relied on some of the tactic or sorry, the rhetoric of kind of you need to vote for me because I'm not that person, um, which is something that Biden adopted a little bit during his kind of presidential campaign. But I don't think it necessarily translated well for some of the Senate races. Um, do you think that played a part of it? Because, and do you think that's, that voters were looking for something a bit more beyond the fact that you need to vote for me because I'm just simply not that other candidate? Um, and especially when you look at the, the race between Amy McGrath and Mitch McConnell, where millions of dollars was thrown into that and Amy still walked away with a very low percentage, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think that the Kentucky race was. I mean, McGrath raised, you're right, she raised a lot of money, but I think going up against Mitch McConnell was probably a fruitless task. Uh, he wasn't likely to lose. As I suggested earlier, I think one of the messaging problems Democrats had was, you know, we're not Trump. And the Republican candidates had to make a decision. Do they stick with Trump or they, do they try and distance themselves from Trump? And I think there was some suggestion in 2018 when the Democrats did pretty well, particularly in the House, 
that maybe distancing themselves from Trump uh, might work. But in, um, in, 2020, in 2020, uh, Democratic candidates, I think their message primarily was, I, my opponent would, would support Trump, I will not support Trump. Um, but that, that I don't think that was enough of a message. I mean, we talk in political science, as you know, about you have to put forward not only why to vote against a candidate, but why to vote for a candidate. And I'm not sure that there was enough of that messaging on the Democratic side. Republican candidates decided to stick with Trump. Democratic candidates decided to say, I'm not Trump. Uh, my opponent is going to stick with Trump. And I just don't think that caught, caught through. Such a good point, especially when you compare it to 2018 and, and the focus on kitchen table issues. Such a good point. Uh, Budin Zalarski, I'm sorry if I just butchered your name. Uh, we'd love uh, to hear you ask your question. Budan, are you out there? Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, right. uh, hello from Warsaw, Poland. Thank you very much for this for this intriguing event. My question is the following. It's a, we already hear some talk about Biden presidency being a, a one term presidency. Yes. And, uh, uh, and, and, and I and I sense in it not just a veiled age issue, but also a gender issue here that th there's some people in the Democratic Party cannot kind of conceal it that they are waiting for the first woman in the White House. And and it's happening at the expense of Kamala Harris, yes, potentially. And it's happening at the expense of Joe Biden before he even assumes office. Uh, some people already turn him into a lame duck. You know, you're there for just four years and make the make road for Kamala to take over in 2024. Uh, what do you make of it? Is this, is it going to continue, or you think it will be silenced by the uh, when when the after the official vote is in, and we know that Joe Biden is the president formally? I think that discussion will go away probably for the next year or eighteen months, but then it's going to come back up because uh, if Kamala Harris is going to run for president in twenty twenty four or any de Democratic candidate is gonna run in 2024, they're gonna to have to start running pretty soon after the midterms in 2022. Uh, this isn't a decision that you can just make. You know, Biden can't announce in the summer of 2024 that he's decided not to run again. That doesn't really give anyone who might try to succeed him much time to run. So there's, because of our elections start so early, um, as I said earlier, we're already start, starting to talk about 2022 and 2024. Um, it's hard to know what's going to happen. Uh, you know, I, I think it, you know, Biden's wanted this job for a long time. Now he's going to have it. Uh, my, you know, we'll see what the age thing looks like. We'll see how his health proceeds. We'll see how he feels about it. I mean, I think one of the things we know about Joe Biden, and we saw this in 2016, is if he doesn't feel he's ready, or in this case, ready to continue, he won't do it. I mean, it was a very heart-wrenching decision for him in 2016 not to run. Um, he wanted to run, but he just didn't feel that he or his family could take it on given the death of his son, Bo. Um, so I think Biden's, you know, I think he knows what's in his heart and he'll do what he thinks is best for him and his family in the country. But I don't think we'll hear much of that discussion, at least for the first year or maybe the first hundred days, we'll see. Taking that question a bit further, obviously in 2008, there was a lot of focus on John McCain and his age and obviously a lot of concern over Sarah Palin and, and her sort of lack of or inexperience, lack of knowledge, uh, worldly knowledge perhaps. Um, and yet obviously Kamala didn't have that sort of same scrutiny, obviously with her history and politics, political experience. Uh, does that maybe perhaps indicate that misogyny played less of a role in, in this election? I think in 2008, it was really focused on Sarah Palin. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I think she just didn't have the experience. Um, it was the governor of a, a pretty small state, a big state in terms of land, but in terms of people. Um, 
Kamala Harris has been the attorney general. She's in the Senate. Uh, she did well in the debates. Um, you know, with Sarah Palin, there were those pretty disastrous interviews with Katie Couric when she was asked what she read and she couldn't really answer that question. So I think Sarah Palin herself came across as not as qualified as she might have been to take over on day one. I, I don't think people felt that way about, about Kamala. Yeah, fair enough. Infamous interviews by Tina Fey, <laughs> like SNL. Yeah. All right, our next question, uh, Louis Nayani, if you'd like to ask your question. Hello? Yes, we can yes. hear you. Uh, hi. Yeah, um, as you, you were saying before about how Trump was talking about uh, running in 2024, and how we've seen Trump's popularity grown, you know, achieving over 70 million votes in America. Um, and Trump and his family kind of work as a unit now, you know. Family have become more and more entrenched, you know, in the world as he was in power. Uh, how likely is it are we going to see his family continue a career in politics and potentially run for the Senate or the House or even the presidency, you know, as we see uh, some political families do. I don't, I, I don't really see it with the Trump family. Um, I don't think Jared and Ivanka really want to go into elected politics. I think they're much happier on the sidelines as advisors and going back to their businesses. Um, I think Donald Jr. may think he might be a good candidate. I'm not sure that many in the Republican Party would agree with that. So I, I, Trump, President Trump has his brand. I don't think that's going to um, trickle down to, to his children. Fair enough. Uh, Emma Hall, uh, would you like to ask your question? Uh, hi, thank you. Um, I was just wanting um, to ask whether you think that this election has shown that there's an increased appetite for split ticket voting in the US politics, particularly given and the narrative we've seen of extreme partisanship in the last kind of few US elections. It was hard for me to hear the question, Laura. Did you hear it and could you repeat it? Yep, uh, let me pull it up. Um, here we go. Uh, no, it seems to have... Uh, sorry, could, could you repeat your question? Uh, oh, no, wait, I've got it. Uh, do you think this election has shown there is an increased appetite for split ticket voting in US politics? particularly given the narrative of extreme partisanship in the last few US elections? I don't think so. I mean, we haven't seen the results yet. Um, clearly there were some people who voted uh, for Biden and then down ballot voted uh, for Republicans in the House or Senate races. I think we're gonna have to do a deeper dive into those numbers, but split ticket voting has, has been on the decrease in this country rather than on the increase. So I think we'll just have to wait until we get more data to, to figure that out. That's great. We've got a lot of interest again with the Trump family. So Louis Allison, would you like to ask your question? Uh, yeah, my question was um, since even 2016, there's been talk that if the Trump family were removed, what well, well, weren't allowed access to the White House, um, that they would try and enter the conservative media game. Um, there's been talk that maybe they might be joining the board of Fox or OAN, or perhaps even starting their own network. What do you think the, um, the implications of that are, especially given the fact that they might be running again in 2024? Uh, thank you very much. You mean in terms of would there be a conflict between having their own network and running in 2024? Is that the question? Uh, yeah. Well, what would be the implications of that in general? Would that would that would that be a conflict of interest? Would that affect the Republican Party to have a brand new uh, influence in the um, in the conservative media circuit? Yes, I think it would because of the following that the president has. Um, I think people would pay attention. I mean, one of the things that we've seen, certainly in this country, is Democrats, progressives, moderates tend to watch and get news from um, 
one sort of stream of information or one and um, conservatives get information from another stream of information. Um, and so it's really become sort of a bifurcated system. And I think given Trump's popularity and his following that would just continue. Great, um, okay, Christine uh, Marjoram, I can't quite see your whole name, but if you're out there, would you like to ask your question? Uh, yes, I would. All right, hello. Um, one of the things that I think is interesting about Biden is that he's had a very long career in Washington, DC. Um, since Carter, uh, candidates with a lot of Washington experience haven't actually done that well. Uh, voters have seemed to prefer governors and other outsiders. And so I was wondering whether in this, um, you know, whether in this election you thought that uh, you know, Biden's lengthy career was uh, helped him or did it hurt him more uh, with the public? It's hard to say, I think. We talk about elections being either change elections or experience elections. And I'm not sure yet which one this was. Um, people weren't looking for a change. I think Biden thought they were, because that was part of the narrative of the blue wave. Um, but he didn't, you know, he didn't succeed down ballot. He didn't, uh, in, in most states, he didn't, um, he didn't do as well in the electoral college as he thought he might. Uh, so I, I don't think there was really a st strong evidence for change, but he did talk about his experience uh, being in Washington. And that may have helped with Democrats or it may have helped with people that, you know, to, to go back to the question about Trump 16, Biden 2020 voters, that may have made a difference uh, for those kinds, for those voters, because um, when when Trump was first elected, we thought there would be a, you know, a, a growing curve for him as he, you know, since he had not, never been in elective office and trying to negotiate being president. And what we learned over four years was the growing curve was for us, not for him, in terms of how we figured out, you know, what a Trump presidency looked like. So. You know, for voters who maybe wanted to go back to a more normal, if you want to say that presidency, maybe Biden seemed like someone who would do that. So I think that's some that's a good question. I think it's something we're just gonna to have to look at over, you know, as we get more data over the next month. That's great. Um, Dolores Rosano, would you like to ask your question? Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. we can hear you. Yeah. Okay. So, so my question is, um, with all this talk about fraud and et cetera, I know it's all part of the theatrics and that even Trump must know that he has no chance of succeeding. But um, I, I'm wondering, like, there's also all these, you know, uh, talk about state legislatures in certain states, like uh, selecting different electors, like Trump electors to send them to the Electoral College. And so, I think this whole theatrics is kind of like, you know, to make the libs <laughs> scared and, you know, go into a panic and that we should maybe, um, you know, not pay much attention to that. But I'm, I'm, you know, in different states, there's all these different like rules and some of them have a lot of leeway or give a lot of leeway to state legislatures or state secretaries. So I was just wondering if that, is an option or, or whether we should be concerned or not? I don't think so. I, I, I mean, there's talk about that. Apparently Trump has been floating that idea with some of his advisors over the past few days, but I think that's really even something that for those who have, are still supporting the president and supporting his decision not to concede the election. I think that is just a bridge too far to suggest that they would elect uh, a different state, a different uh, group of electors who would vote against the popular vote in their particular state. I don't see that happening. I, I think a lot of this is just for Trump to get his head around the fact that he didn't win. And however he justifies that to himself is really up to him. Um, but I, I think in the end, the process will f uh, flow smoothly, more smoothly than it has over the last week or so. Um, I like that optimism. 
Uh, just following <laughs> on from that question, though, you, your final slide, I think, you talked about state legislators. And you talked about how the Democrats who have obviously been behind the Republicans in their local ground game to regain control of state legislatures. Um, why do you think the Democrats are struggling so much to, to gain more control of these states? I don't know. I think that's an interesting question because there was a lot of money raised and put into trying to flip those states and, mm -hmm. and they didn't succeed. And I think we're just going to have to wait till we see more data to figure out why that was. We love yeah. the data, don't we? <laughs> All right, Elizabeth Grant, would you like to ask your question? If you can hear me okay, yeah? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, good, thanks. Um, um, I remember seeing a senator back in 2009, uh, I think it was a clip that CNN put up, and he was saying that the transition period should be in some way um, formalized in law um, to prevent what, uh, obviously he didn't know that someone like Trump was going to appear on the scene, but he had uh, sort of concerns about how it could be made more smooth and how if someone did make things very difficult for the incoming uh, president, how that could be ameliorated. Um, do you think there's any chance that that might get uh, some purchase uh, in the Senate and Congress once Biden's in? <laughs> Yes, I think, um, I think that will be looked at. And there were some changes put in place, I believe by the Bush administration um, following the 2004 election, um, because there was some, and there've been some studies that have come out recently that, um, that maybe 9-11 not wouldn't have happened, but things might've been different if, if there hadn't been the, the delay in, dis, in uh, deciding who the president was in the 2000 presidential election. So I think that's something will be, it will be looked at, but again, it's gonna depend on the makeup of the House and Senate. Um, really good point. Uh, Lenary Hashani, would you like to ask your question? Hi, it's Lorena. Um, thanks so much. Really interesting. And um, my question is really a, a very simple one for for a lesson to the rest of the world. Really, um, is Biden's victory? Do you think Biden's victory is going to be seen as sort of the end of the era of populism as we've known it for the last five years? Yeah, I think, uh, and I think we've already seen this. I think around the world. Um, there will be a thinking that a Biden presidency will be more normal. That um, when you when you deal with the president elect or then President Biden, you, you know what you're getting. He's not going to change his mind from you know one day or one month to the next. So I, I think I think there will be it will be seen as a more stable presidency than than what we've had over the last four years. Ilaria Dejoa, would you like to ask your question? Yes, uh, thank you very much. My question is about uh, Biden and the Supreme Court and the courts uh, that, as we know, um, have been now inundated with conservative uh, judges. Um, it, it's going to be a challenge for President Biden, uh, especially a conservative Supreme Court. Uh, we're not sure to what extent he's ready to upheld uh, Biden reforms. Um, however, last week, uh, the Supreme Court has heard uh, the ACA, the Affordable Care Act challenge, and uh, Justice Kavanaugh seems to agree with the liberal side of the court that the, the act should, uh, should stay, should not be um, stricken down. Um, is this a good sign? Is this an early sign of a, shall we say, compliant Supreme Court, or is it not? Um, what What is your um, your thinking around the relationship between the court and and Biden? I think it's too it's too early to tell. I mean, it looked like. Um, both Justice Kavanaugh and Justice Roberts were not in favor of striking down the ACA. And um, so, but that's just one case. And it's it's really the first major case with, uh, with six conservative justices. I think it's gonna depend on um, what the issues are, but it, it, it is, um, 
I mean, there are six conservative justices, but as, as you know, we've seen in the history of the court, sometimes justices are appointed, are seen as conservative or liberal, and as their time on the court evolves, their positions change. So in the short term, it, I think it's, it's gonna be difficult, but, uh, but remember the, the court is supposed to be nonpartisan. I mean, that's, you know, change some, uh, some might argue. But uh, when justices are appointed to the court, they're supposed to leave their partisan views uh, at the door and listen to each case on its own merit. Again, Laura, maybe I'm being too optimistic. But. I could use the optimism, I love it. <laughs> okay, I'm about to go back to some people who have second questions. So if you haven't asked a question yet and would like to, please do take this opportunity. In the meantime, uh, Bill Barnard, would you like to ask your question? Uh, this is the one on um, oh, gerrymandering, by, I think. by gerrymandering, yes. Uh, you said that we'd have to wait to look at, to analyze the returns to see why the Republicans, uh, the Democrats didn't do very well down ballot in, with the state legislatures. But it seems to me that, um, wouldn't you agree that it's really the partisan gerrymandering following the 2010 census that really led to um, the Democrats' inability to make changes in the state legislature. There, were, there was a concerted effort this time. There were fundraising organizations like the, um, rather like the congressional committees organized in the same way that, that funneled their, their monies towards the state legislative races. And there were specific states that were set out that we could flip a, 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 a one's house or the other. It just didn't work. Uh, and, and on the Supreme Court business, wouldn't you agree that so often the Supreme Court decision turns not on whether a, an act is good or bad, like the uh, Health Care Act, but rather upon legal questions that have nothing to do with the policy matter. I mean, the Supreme Court on, in this decision basically said that you can separate the one clause that the, the, the case is trying to eliminate from the um, CARE Act, uh, and yet the rest of the thing stands, unless Congress has indicated otherwise. And in this case, they hadn't, and so the law stands. So it's really a procedural question that this question is turning on, not that they're acquiescing in um, the healthcare law. No, I think I think that your your second point is is, is fair. I mean, and, and that's the way the court is supposed to decide issues on the legal questions, not on the more general policy issues. Um, yeah, I mean, redistricting following the 2010 election had pretty interesting um, consequences for the makeup of the House of Representatives. And we'll see what happens uh, with this census. And, and there are some questions, as you know, from this census because it was, it was stopped sooner than it, than it might have. And um, so that there were gonna be questions about was everyone counted? And if those, who were the people who weren't counted? And what are the implications of that for, um, the number of people in each state and each congressional district. Emily Cunning has a great question about cabinet appointments. Emily, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, hi, thank you. Um, I was just wondering, how do you think the significance of the Senate currently hanging in the balance of power, depending on the uh, Georgia runoff seats, will influence Biden's cabinet appointments? Like, are the appointments more likely to be um, more centrist figures than progressives like Warren and Sanders, um, and more broadly, how will that kind of affect the um, ideological debates in the Democratic Party? Yeah, I think that's a great question, and it's one we probably don't know the answer to yet. I mean, there was a story floating around yesterday that perhaps Bernie Sanders would be nominated as Secretary of Labor. Um, I think that's a question Biden's going to have to deal with. How does he deal with cabinet appointments, one, that he can get through the, through the Senate, uh, and two, that balance the progressive and the moderate wings of the party so that both are, are happy, but also that are people that he feels that he can work with. So that's something that's all to be determined. I, I think the transition team is working on that. Um, but again, it's only been six days since we knew who the, who the president was gonna be, at least according to the networks. Okay, Suknami Malhi has a question uh, that they'd like me to ask because their mic doesn't work. Um, could we put the argument forward, had it not been for COVID, we would be looking at a second Trump term? 
No, not not <laughs> not not in the next four years. I mean, there may be a second Trump term if he decides to run in 2024. That would be the second Trump term. But I don't know if, if Secretary Pompeo thought he was joking. I mean, it, it really wasn't a joke. He's a Secretary of State. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't think it was appropriate for him to say that. Um, but but no, there's not going to be a second Trump term starting on January 20th. No, I think the question was, had it not been for COVID, or like a counterfactual, um, oh, you, oh, would, would you have predicted uh, Trump winning, say, back in January or something like that. Yes. Yes. Okay. Mainly on the no, economy. When I was, I was, when I was asked a year ago, um, back in the day when we actually had Thanksgiving with other people, um, who I thought would win, and I said I thought the odds were that Trump would be reelected. Okay. Okay. And it, that was partly because of presumably the economy at the time and the fact that it could be quite hard to unseat a sitting president. Yes, it was be a referendum on the president. The economy was very strong, would have con likely continued to be strong. Um, I'm not sure that Biden would have been the nominee. Uh, it's hard to know. Um, but yeah, I, I think th the president was probably right in assuming he would be reelected. I think that was a that was I, I thought the odds were better than 50 50, given where the country was back in January and also but um, Trump had a lot of money. That's another sort of interesting story in this election. Trump started the year with over $200 million. Biden was not seen as a very strong fundraiser at the beginning, um, but he overcame that over the summer and in the fall and outraised Trump in that time period. And so I think that's an interesting question as to what happened to Trump's fundraising ability? And that, that will play into it if he decides to run in 2024. Um, so I, you know, if one way to express your support for a candidate is through votes, another way is to express it through money. Uh, Biden may have done well in that area, at least in the, in the fall and late summer. Do you see that the way the candidates approach the debates as well, kind of, I know there's always a debate as to uh, how significant the presidential debates are, uh, whether they actually sway votes. Do you think that COVID and its impact on the debates, how the presidential candidates handled the debates, do you think that has sort of even diminished the impact of debates even further? Well, the fact that we only had two was an issue. Um, and it, it gets to the sort of messaging issue, Trump really downplayed COVID. He, to this day, he downplays COVID. He doesn't wear a mask. We saw, you know, four members of his inner circle are now quarantined with COVID, um, largely because of the election night party. Uh, they weren't wearing masks. Um, and so that, I think that was the messaging, uh, you know, to, you know, two voters. And, and it is still, I mean, the fact that the one thing that we know is wearing a mask can help save lives. And yet we still see or saw the president having rallies with people not wearing masks, not social distancing. Uh, and his message, you know, his message was he had COVID, the first lady had COVID, their son Baron had COVID. It was no big deal. He was fine. And that that's, I don't think that's a responsible message. And I think most public health officials would agree with that. Absolutely. Okay, Tom Packer has another question. This one on Stacey Abrams. Tom? Hi, um, uh, th thanks very much. Um, I was, um, I was, I was going to say uh, um, on COVID that most incumbent governments have gone up in popularity on COVID. So perhaps there is a bit more of a suggestion um, that Trump would um, uh, won anyway. But I, I, I had a um, sort of twofold question. One is given Stacey Abrams, the only candidate to have underperformed Biden in a swing state. So the only candidate in 2018 who did worse than Biden in 2020. Doesn't that suggest she was actually a sub, she was actually relatively weak, is and was a relatively weak Democratic candidate, maybe because some of her stances like blowing up the most famous monument in Georgia. And the flip, and um, yeah, sorry, I'll just ask that question. I think the fact that she did as well as she did suggests she was not a weak candidate. I mean, Georgia was a red state. Um, there were there were questions um, in Georgia about 
ballot counting, about uh, ballot access. Uh, remember, the Secretary of State at the time was also running for governor, and some people thought that was a conflict of interest. So I, and I think Stacey Abrams gets a lot of credit for the fact that Biden did carry Georgia in this election. That's great. I'm going to round it up with one final question, and that's about the polls. We haven't talked about the polls. And obviously the pollsters, you know, again, they said, oh, no, we've got it this time after 2016. Where do pollsters go from here? How much trust should we have with pollsters? I think that's a great question. And, you know, the polls weren't, they weren't as off as they seemed to be in 2016. The American Association of Public Opinion Research did an extensive study. Um, and they found the state polls were not as accurate. Um, but I think one of the questions that's going to be asked is how do how does polling measure support for Trump? Mm -hmm. you know, there wasn't much wasn't much uh, sign in um, the APOR report of a shy Trump voter, but that notion has come back again. Uh, so APOR is going to do another study this time, and we'll see what happens. Um, but I think it's important to remember that polls, I mean, we focus on polls as who's going to win or who won. But polls tell us a lot of other things uh, about messages, uh, about policy issues. Mm -hmm. So the polling industry, I think, is going to be around. It's just a question of what it looks like. Um, I was on a webinar on Tuesday, and that very issue came up. And given you know, people are reluctant to answer their phones. You know, the response rate is pretty low and going down. Um, there's a question of what role polling will play, but it's still going to play an important role. All right, optimism again. We love it. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'm going to hand it back to Cara now. Okay, thank you so much, and thank you to uh, to Candice and to. Uh, to Laura for some um, really fantastic and really uh, detailed discussion. We got through a lot there. I think uh, that, that's great. Uh, so we're now going to have a 30 minute break. Uh, I said to my colleagues earlier, if this was the real world, I would be pointing you to where the toilets are and the tea. Um, but since you're all, I hope, in your own homes, I hope you know where those things are. So I would encourage you to go and make use of those, uh, those resources. Um, we will be back uh, in just under half an hour. Uh, that's at quarter to the hour. It will be 3.45 uh, for those of us in the UK. Um, the rest of you, you have to make your own adjustments. I, ca I can't possibly cope with multiple time zones. <laughs> uh, it's enough that we're all here. Uh, so thank you so much once again uh, to Laura and Candice. And we look forward to seeing everybody else uh, at uh, quarter two when we're going to uh, introduce our special guests, our former members of Congress, uh, George Holding and Loretta Sanchez. So thanks very much, everyone. And we'll see you shortly. Thank you. That was great, Candy. Thank you. Uh, good to see you after a, a good few years. And yes. hopefully we'll see well, you. Well, thank you for inviting me. It was fun. <laughs> I enjoyed the questions. Oh, oh fabulous. Well, it was, it was a good job. And the questions came along really nicely. And uh, yeah, I look forward to uh, uh, when we can actually get to APSA again. Hello and welcome back everybody. Um, we've got about one minute till we start our second session. I just want to say um, thank you very much for coming back. We appreciate it. We know it's, uh, you know, it can feel like a long time sitting in front of your computer on a Friday afternoon, but I hope you'll agree. We had a really fantastic first session. It was really, um, really wide ranging and really informative. I'm sure a lot of the questions that got asked um, could just as interestingly be uh, address to our speakers uh, coming up uh, in a moment. Um, but just uh, as we get started, um, if you weren't here earlier, I guess I'm just a random person talking to you from a red room. My name is Cara Rodway and I am uh, the acting head of the Echo Centre for American Studies at the British Library. We're the host of the event today, which is organised in a partnership with our friends at the American Politics Group of the Political Studies Association, uh, who we have had a, a long-standing uh, partnership with over many years, organising these um, colloquiums uh, to tie into our Congress to Campus programme, which is 
a program that we do twice a year, uh, now also in collaboration with the Rothermere American Institute at the University of Oxford. And we, uh, twice a year, we bring two members, um, former members of the US Congress, one Democrat, one Republican, uh, to the UK and invite them to talk with British audiences um, from school students upwards about um, what's going on in American politics and particularly about their own personal experience as uh, politicians. So um, I'm going to hand over now uh, to uh, my good friend and colleague, Professor Philip Davies, uh, who is currently the co-chair of the um, APG. And he's just gonna say a few words before uh, handing over to our chair and speakers for this second session. So thank you, Phil. Thank you. Um, welcome everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, be at this uh, virtual um, uh, APG colloquium. Uh, the American Politics Group has been involved with the uh, program uh, alongside the Echo Center and the US former members of Congress um, for quite a few years. And it really is a, a, a remarkable opportunity uh, that we have through the generous co cooperation of these uh, to uh, be able to talk with uh, um, people who have worked at the coal face of, of US politics. Um, it's wonderful when we meet uh, uh, these members of Congress, former members of Congress in person, uh, and I'm sure that will return again. I do hope that when that happens that uh, Loretta and George uh, will be amongst the ones who will come and visit. Um, uh, I want to thank the Echo Center uh, uh, for it's help in hosting this. We wouldn't have been able to do it without you. Um, and uh, also at the same time to mention to all of the audience that um, uh, the other uh, major event that the American Politics Group traditionally puts on is a conference in January, which we shall be doing virtually um, as best we can. Uh, and so please look out uh, any, any moment now for the call for papers for a, a conference which will take place uh, towards the end of January this year. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, George, Loretta. Thank you, uh, Clara. Uh, and thank you certainly, uh, Dr. Jo Josephine Harmon, who's going to chair this session for us. Um, and unlike me, who is one of the oldest members of the American Policy Group, is actually one of the, one of the, uh, youngest and uh, welcome, welcome uh, new members, uh, relatively new members of the American Policy Group. I hope there are going to be many more. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Phil. Um, so George, Loretta, it's great to be here and, and to speak with you today. Um, I actually had to come up with a few questions, you know, that I wanted to ask you as chair. And I came up with loads and loads, about 40 actually. So I'm not gonna ask that many. I'm gonna come to the floor hopefully sooner than that. But it just shows you how exciting this election cycle has been and just how much I think there is to pull out of it if you are a political obsessive like I think a lot of us are here. Um, so thank you to both of you for joining us. Um, if I could just before we um, go into a discussion, if I could get you to introduce yourselves. Loretta, if we start with you, could you just tell us a bit about yourself, how you got involved in politics, what your interests are politically, that kind of thing. Super, well, first of all, thank you to everyone it's a big effort to put one of these on, even when um, even when it is virtual versus in person. So thank you to everybody. Um, I'm a Californian. I represent Orange. I represented Orange County, California, for 20 years in the U.S. Congress um, until 2017. Um, if you have been to Disneyland, you have been to my hometown of Anaheim and really the heart of the district that I represented. And how did I get involved in uh, Congress? I actually was not a politician. Actually, if you look at me, if you look at my family, my family is, my parents are from Mexico. They're immigrants, um, working class. They met here in Anaheim. They had seven children. Um, I'm a Head Start child, a public school kid, someone who went to university on a um, labor scholarship and, uh, Pell Grants, so the, the grants from the fed, federal government. And my MBA was paid for by the Rotary Club of Anaheim. Um, 
my parents have the distinction in the United States of being the only parents in the history of our nation to send two daughters to the United States Congress. Mm -hmm. So while I served 20 years and got out a few years ago, my younger sister is uh, now in her 18th year and just won re-election. So she's still in the Congress. When I was in the Congress, well, when I ran, um, I was not political. I just got mad one day because my member of Congress would not meet with me on an education issue that I had. And so I went home and I said to my family, I'm going to run for Congress. And uh, it's a very grassroots uh, type of situation that we had. In fact, it's in many of the history books of, you know, sort of a Mr. Smith goes to Washington, someone who didn't um, envision that or knew about that, but got mad enough to go. And um, while I was in the Congress, I headed um, many subcommittees and committees, um, mostly in military and homeland security, and um, also the economic joint committee between the Senate and the House. So um, my, my specialties were um, nuclear proliferation and non-proliferation, um, chemical warfare, um, I headed the committee for our special operations for the military, traveled the world with respect to intelligence and nuclear issues. And, um, and my district is a very bread and butter district, uh, had been held by a Republican for 18 years. And I was the only Democrat, the only Latina, the only um, minority, the only woman um, and fairly young, honestly, um, to be sent from Orange County to the House of Representatives. And um, I've been out now, I've been working mostly on um, international issues with respect to economic development. Uh, I spent some time at Harvard as their leadership fellow and um, now with George Washington University. So just helping my community and helping where I can. Excellent. Thank you so much. I mean, that's a really thorough and, and interesting introduction of yourself. Thank you so much. Um, George, can I get you to do the same, please? George, if you're there. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Great. Hi. Can you, can you see me? We can't see you. Okay. I'm having a little technical difficulty that's here, okay. but the, the, um, the course. let's see. I've got too many. I've got too many devices going at the same time. We can see you. Okay. All right. The, uh... So yeah, if you could um, just tell us a little, a little bit about your career in college. Sure. Absolutely. The uh, happy to. So. Um, I've been in Congress about eight years and uh, I'm from North Carolina and um, I'm about 2,800 miles away from Loretta. Um, two different time, three different time zones um, in the United States. And uh, so when, before I ran for Congress, I was serving as the United States attorney in North Carolina and um, the United States is divided into 94 prosecutorial groups. The, um, and the president appoints one attorney to handle all federal matters, all federal litigation uh, for each one of those prosecutorial uh, areas. And you're appointed by the president and you're confirmed by the United States Senate. Um, I had the good fortune of being uh, nominated and appointed by uh, President Bush George W. Bush, and then I continued to serve for about two and a half years after President Obama was elected. Um, and I really had no intention of running for Congress. It was it was not in the not in the long range plan. Um, but as I was leaving the U.S. Attorney's Office, uh, they redrew the districts in North Carolina, and uh, where I live in the state, they drew a Republican leaning district. And I've got a brother who's always been very involved in politics. And uh, he came to me and said, you really ought to run. And uh, so he kind of talked me into it. And I said, well, OK. And before I could change my mind, he leaked it to the press that 
I would be running for Congress and it was in the paper the next day. So he, he caught me and I couldn't back out. Um, the, uh, when I came to Congress, the first committees I served on were the Judiciary Committee, which is kind of natural. And I worked a lot on intellectual property issues. And I also served on the Foreign Affairs Committee, um, which that was kind of natural as well. I had worked for a United States Senator earlier in my career, who was chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee in the Senate. And um, I lived in abroad, I uh, lived in England, and you know, we have this special relationship between the United States and the United Kingdom. And I like to say I live that special relationship every day because my wife is from England and my four children are all um, dual nationals of the United States and the United Kingdom. Um, the uh, recently, uh, last year, uh, they redrew the districts again in North Carolina and they changed where I live to a Republican leaning area and by changing the boundaries of the constituency, uh, they turned it into a overwhelmingly Democrat leaning uh, district. Uh, so I did not stand for reelection in this uh, most recent election and the Democrat running in that race won by about 30 points. So uh, I don't think I could have won that one even under the best of circumstances. Um, for the last three terms in Congress, I've served on the Ways and Means Committee, uh, which focuses primarily on trade issues and taxation issues. Um, and it's been a lot of fun. I actually served with Loretta's sister, Linda. Uh, she's on that committee and uh, we're on kind of opposite sides of the ideological spectrum, but I consider her a friend and she's a very productive and intelligent and engaged member and uh, I've enjoyed our debates over the number of years and look forward to our friendship going forward. Um, the, I'm sure we'll have lots of questions about what's going on in politics and so forth. And I look forward to, to taking all of those questions. Thank you. Great, thank you so much for those um, introductions. It's great to, to meet you both. Um, so my first question to kick off and guys out there listening, if you could think of your questions, start thinking of them now and input them into our Q&A section I'll then come to you and um, we can open up to, up to the floor um, so just to warn everybody up um, if I can at first ask for your reactions to the election results and ask whether you were uh, expecting it so a little update I'm sure uh, everybody's been following it uh, <clears throat> especially in the APG but Biden looks on course for winning um, with 306 in the electoral college he's got about a five million lead in the popular vote right now Big wins were Arizona and, of course, Georgia, which looks like it's going to be flipped. Um, and, of course, he regained the, Rus the Rust Belt in Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan and Pennsylvania. Um, Sarah, can I get your um, your reactions to the results? First off. Sure. Well, uh, let me start then. Um, I'm a Democrat. I obviously was working hard for uh, the Biden ticket. California is very left-leaning, so um, I actually put my efforts into Florida because I have for a long time, as there is a large span in particular of Latinos down there, we're changing the Cuban-American vote to be more democratic, and we're, there's a lot of Puerto Ricans and um, new people uh, from South America and Central America coming to Florida, so Florida is definitely one of those states where traditionally um, you can win or lose a presidential election. In fact, in the uh, Gore election of 2000, I was the chair of the national party of the Democratic National Committee, and we lost um, to George Bush by about 500 votes in Florida that year. So um, I had anticipated that Florida and Pennsylvania and the Rust Belt states would really be the states um, in play. Uh, Mark Kelly is a very strong candidate in Arizona, and I knew that we would be winning not only that Senate seat, but also Arizona for the Democrats. So I put my efforts in those real swing states to try to help um, with respect to disclosure. My husband is a Republican, a very conservative out of Pennsylvania, is, a, is all his family. They all voted Trump. So we have a very divided um, family with respect to politics sometimes, and in particular in this um, election. 
And um, so I could see what the other side was thinking. I understand them. I knew we were in for a hard fight. And um, I'm glad that Biden will be the president elect. I think the Senate um, was a little bit closer than I thought. And I still think that it will probably remain in Republican hands. And that I think will be an, an okay thing because divided government means that you have to compromise a lot more than when you control all the levers of government here. I was surprised that the house lost so many seats, although it looks like we'll lose a couple of seats that we had flipped the last time here in my own county. And I saw that coming. I, I knew they would be hard elections. And I guess um, the biggest surprise, not to me, but to so many, because some have targeted this and we put a lot of money as Democrats into this to um, try to flip the state legislatures in our favor because they are the ones that will redistrict the new lines. My colleague George alluded to it in his um, state has gone through a lot of redistricting over the last decade, but um, most states just redistrict one time every 10 years. It's coming up in the next set of elections for 2022. And in over 40 of our states, the people who control drawing those lines are our state legislators and governors. And clearly on November 3rd of this year, uh, the Republicans definitely won that battle. And I think that it means that they will be able to draw their districts more favorably to trying to pick off a majority in the House of Representatives. Mm, yeah, and George, what did you make of, um, there was some really interesting points there, I think, especially in terms of the gridlocked Congress that we're seeing and the implications for the Biden administration going forward. Um, George, same thing, what was your response to the result? Were you expecting a Biden win? Uh, well, I didn't think that Trump was doing as poorly as the polls reflected. Um, you know, just traveling, the, the polling in North Carolina had uh, Trump fairly behind in the race by a number of points. Um, and just traveling around the state, um, you know, you, I just didn't feel like the, the polls were right. You know, folks who campaign a lot um, kind of have this super sensory uh, perception <laughs> when you're traveling around. Um, you know, whether it be the number of yard signs out or the number of people showing up at rallies um, or just the chatter that you pick up. So I didn't think that Trump was be as behind. Uh, I was very worried about our congressional seats across the nation. Uh, the polling, um, you know, was pretty poor and it looked like that we were going to lose, you know, a number of seats. Um, you know, it was forecasted that if the Democrats had a bad night, they would only pick up five seats. And if they had a good night, they could pick up as many as 20 seats. Um, and you know, none of that came to fruition. Uh, the Republicans are, are poised to pick up you know, 10 or more seats. Um, so I was surprised about that. Um, and going into this next Congress, the Democrats will have um, the smallest minority or smallest majority number uh, than they've had in many, many decades, I think, since World War II. Um, and that presents difficulties uh, for the Democratic leadership to hold their conference together because um, as if you looked at the votes in the you know, this Congress that we're in right now, uh, there would consistently be 10, 15 um, Democrats that would break with the party, break with the Democrat party and vote with Republicans on some procedural matters and some other matters as well. And uh, a lot of those Democrats are actually coming back to Congress. Uh, not all of them, some of them were defeated, but uh, so Speaker Pelosi is gonna have difficulty holding her uh, conference together on some of the, the most progressive uh, matters that she wants to put forward. And you know, just as the Republicans, when we were in the majority, you know, we had a um, kind of a split in our conference between people who are very, very conservative and people who are more moderate. And it was difficult for us to hold a majority together on votes. Um, so they're gonna face the same thing. And as um, uh, Biden um, goes forward and tries to put forward an agenda, if he's really counting on a progressive agenda, I don't think he's going to get there because not only will they have difficulties in the house, 
uh, it looks very likely that Republicans will control uh, in the Senate. Um, we'll have two runoff races on January 5th in Georgia, uh, which will be incredibly expensive. Um, and uh, I think we'll come ahead with the majority in the Senate. And you know, any bill needs to pass both houses uh, in its exact form. So uh, I don't think that uh, Biden will be able to put forth a, a really uh, progressive agenda. And I, of course, think that's a good thing as a Republican. But I also think it's a good thing for the country if uh, bills pass with you know, some members of the minority party uh, supporting them. Um, when Loretta was in Congress and the Democrats controlled both the House and the Senate and the White House, they passed the Affordable Health Care Act with no Republican votes and Republicans never accepted it and basically half the country never accepted it. And conversely, um, or similarly, when Republicans had control of the House and the Senate and the White House, we passed a, a very large tax reform bill, which I was uh, involved in uh, to a very large extent um, on the Ways and Means Committee. And of course, no Democrats voted for that. And of course, Democrats and half the country has never accepted the legitimacy of that. So uh, perhaps with divided government, um, we'll come up with some legislative solutions uh, that will stick. So, yeah, I we'll think this is, sorry, no, I think those are really interesting insights, actually. Um, can I ask you then what you, who you think Biden will choose for his cabinet appointees? Will it be a Hail Mary to the progressive wing of the party? Or do you think, well, the left is going to be sidelined now that he's won the election? I believe that he will have to put some positions um, to some more progressive people. Uh, clearly, he, I have worked with Joe Biden. I served many years in the Congress with him. He is a senator and I in the House. Um, he was one of the first senators to reach out to me when I got to the House. So we have a long relationship, a very good relationship. He was uh, really helpful when he was a vice president for the issues that I needed for my district. So we have a long working relationship. And he is not a, uh, I, I would not label him with liberal at all. Um, I think he understands that the country needs to heal and to heal you have to work from the middle out, but he will be under a lot of pressure from the progressives who got, uh, who feel, we'll see when the actual tally comes out, there were clearly just more voters who came to this election. And so getting out those key voters in strategic states um, was what made Biden win. Now, the progressives will say, well, we brought people who never voted and they voted because of our liberal stances. I'm not so sure that's true. We'll have to look at those, but certainly that is the mantra. That, that's what they're saying. And so they're anticipating that they will um, have a lot of those seats on the cabinet. Um, I, th I think what we'll see is probably um, African-Americans there because of the whole Black Lives Matter and the whole um, focus on the African-American population. Um, I would like to think that he will have um, Latinos on his cabinet more than just one or two, um, but you know that I had that hope during Obama's administration, and we didn't get anywhere very, very much with with that. Um, I think you'll see women on there, and as to specifics, uh, I you know there there's so many good people out there. I think he will not be pulling from the Senate very much because of those Georgia races and the very closeness of the Senate. He really needs the experience of the senators there in the Senate. I think you'll see some House members uh, want to go over, maybe even some of the more moderate ones because um, they're not gonna really appreciate the, the fact that the, the Democratic side of the House, the Democratic caucus has moved so much more to the left. So I think you'll see some members who We'll try to go over to um, to the cabinet. Uh, I know there are a lot of names that have been thrown out there. I don't think Biden is. Um, I think he's very interested in foreign policy. 
So he's interested, he's really thinking about who's gonna be his secretary of state. I think he wants to uh, put, put the military back in its place. And that's a positive thing, you know, m make America understand that the military is, um, is everybody's military and not politicize it. And so I think that's an important position that he's looking at. And, um, and I think his attorney general, I think right now he's thinking about those three positions and who he might put in there. Yeah. And do you think we'll see a big name, a big progressive name like a Bernie Sanders or a Elizabeth Warren, maybe with her antitrust um, legislation that she wants to pass or, or maybe um, Sanders in labor or in education? Do you think we'll see that? Or I, Well, certainly Bernie has um, has signaled that he wants to be labor secretary and Elizabeth has signaled that she would like treasury. Um, my, I, for, for sure, I don't believe that um, Elizabeth can go over because there's a Republican um, governor in Massachusetts. So he will choose a Republican. So that would tip the Senate. Do you see what I'm saying? Further away from us. Um, and Bernie runs as an independent. He caucuses with us. Vermont could go either way. I mean, it's traditionally a blue state, but if you have the right personality, it could become a, um, a Republican Senate senator from there. So I guess what I would say is Biden has the uh, has a good excuse not to put those two in the cabinet and maybe go to a more moderate or less lightning rod sort of a, a personality. Mm, interesting. Um, and George, what are your thoughts on a potential um, cabinet selections by Biden? Will it be, again, maybe some progressive appointees or what do you think? Well, first off, I think Loretta would make a very, very, very good member of uh, Biden's cabinet. For the, uh, so I'm all for that. And Loretta, I can either be for you or against you, whatever, whatever you think is going to help. <laughs> You're so sweet, George. Um, I think yeah. I'm a little too moderate for, for many out there right now. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so, you know, Joe Biden came, was elected to the United States Senate in 1972. Um, so he's coming up on almost five decades of Washington um, service. And the if you look across those five decades, he has never been considered a progressive. The, um, you, you would never have labeled him that. Um, that's just not where his natural instincts are. Um, it's not where his Delaware and Pennsylvania roots are. Um, and so his natural inclination just left to his own devices. I think he would have a pretty moderate um, cabinet populated with people with deep Washington experience because those are the ones that he's very comfortable working with. You know, he just appointed as his chief of staff, someone who started working with him in 1989. Um, so um, he definitely likes to be surrounded with people that he knows well, but he will get pushed by the left. and. You know, as just as um, Biden was never considered a progressive senator, um, Kamala Harris uh, was um, noted as being the most liberal United States senator. Um, so you've got polar opposites there uh, within the Democrat Party um, at the you know at the top of that structure. So I do think there are going to be some progressives in there. I don't think uh, Bernie Sanders. Uh, will be in. I don't think Elizabeth Warren will be in, but I do think you're going to see some um, some very progressive um, folks in a few positions, you know, in the cabinet. And he'll balance that out. I think there'll be some Republicans in the cabinet as well. Um, yeah, you know, at least one. I don't know who that'll be, but I, I think they'll have one one Republican in there to to balance it out. Uh oh, sorry, Joe, you're, you're muted. Okay, that was my bad. I'm sorry about that. I didn't press the right, um, the correct button. And thank you for you all for waving madly at me to make me remember. I appreciated that, Phil. Um, 
Okay, let's go to the floor then and take some questions from people watching. So I'd like to first go to, uh, I'm sorry if I, I mispronounce your name, Sakmani uh, Mali, uh, who asks an interesting question about uh, political participation. I think she might have an issue uh, with microphone. Her mic, okay, well, I'll, um, I'll read out that question. She should be there now, no? Okay. Um, let me get her question up. Sorry, guys, tech issues. So she, her question was, um, so she says, we were all very impressed by the amount of political participation in this election. Do you believe that momentum will continue in the future as democratic rights are exercised or will apathy overtake it? Thank you both. What, uh, so Loretta, if we start with, with you on that one, what do you think, P continuing political participation or apathy? As, as I said, we, we did see a very good participation in the in in the United States here in my county alone we had one of the we had the highest turnout ever 86 percent of registered voters um, I think honestly in a presidential election of course more people turn out but I think there was a really I think from the Democratic side there was a real big anti-Trump vote I don't um, it wasn't so much pro Biden, it was really anti-Trump, anybody but let's vote, you know, let's go vote. And there was a lot of, um, of uh, vote splitting, you know, ticket splitting because uh, it was no Trump, but it was, yeah, you know, the Republicans won down the ballot in a lot of places. They won, um, they, they won back some of those house seats. So um, the question for me would be, so in, in two years from now, will those same anti-Trump type voters show up to vote? Um, and I think probably the answer is no. I think if Biden writes the ship in the minds of a lot of people that um, they're going to get on, they're going to get on with their lives and they probably won't um, come out to vote unless the Democrats put in a lot of money for door-to-door -door canvassing and grassroots and really keep these people involved. Um, that's a possibility. On the Republican side, I think a lot of those pro-Trump voters are gonna be still very angry and I think they're, they're gonna show up to vote. So I think we're gonna have some tough elections uh, come 20, 2022. And of course we're gonna have redistricting. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a crystal ball as to, you know, how and where and what, but I think there'll be lower participation, maybe on the democratic side and, uh, and, and maybe not as high participation on the Republican side, but pretty high from what I can see would be my, my guess at it. Right. Yeah. And George, what would be your response to Sigmani's question? So I think, you know, I'm delighted that we had such a high participation rate. Um, um, you know, it's, it's really record numbers. Um, and I think that we're going to have high participation rates going forward because, you know, um, America is a divided nation and passions are running, you know, very high on both sides. And if you look, uh, I've been trying to start looking at you know some of the results in a little more detail and reading some articles and so forth and it appears that what Biden did is you know certainly there were some uh independent voters and some kind of swing voters that swung to Biden rather than to Trump this time but really the way he he won this election is they turned out more of their base voters um and Trump turned out more of his base voters as well, but not as well as what Biden did. And, um, you know, Trump, as, as Loretta said, you know, did better with uh, Latinos than he had done in the past. Um, he did better with African-Americans than he'd done in the past. Um, so Trump was, I mean, Biden was just better at turning out people who were gonna vote for Biden uh, rather than flipping people. Um, and, you know, if the advent of social media, you know, I think that's increasing voter participation. Um, and, you know, the amount of money being spent in these races, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, the message is just getting to more people. Um, in the 2016 presidential race, the presidential and congressional races combined in 2016, uh, the 
combined spending was around six billion dollars. Um, the combined spending in 2020 was 14 billion dollars. Um, that that's a lot of money. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head how much was spent in the UK in the last general election, um, but it was it was in the millions of pounds. I mean, single digit millions of pounds. Um, so nothing nothing like what we're spending here. And when you're bombarded by this advertising um, over and over and over again, and all the paid staffers going door to door, it's going to increase voter participation. And, and I think that's, that's a very good thing. One would hope that with the increased participation, you would also have an increase in the public's confidence in the outcome of the election and saying, hey, you know, 76% of Americans went out and voted. A decision has been made. And we're going to get behind, you know, the leaders that we've sent to Washington. Um, you know, unfortunately, because of the division in America, you know, that's not where we are. Um, I think there's actually less confidence in the, the folks that we're sending to Washington by the general public out there. And I think that's an unfortunate thing. Yeah, I think it's an interesting observation. I, I would agree with you there. Um, OK, next question. We're going to go to Peter Finn, um, if he can ask his question live. Well, members of Congress, that would be fantastic. Hi there, um, thanks. Um, really interesting insight so far. I just wondered to what extent is it likely Trump will essentially just get taken over by events in the next, um, I guess, four to six weeks or so, kind of refusing to concede, um, you know, giving uh, interviews that appear to be more and more disjointed from reality and then essentially everyone else just moves on. Thanks. Um, the, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, the, um, um, yeah, the electors, the, the states are going to certify their results. I think that's November 20th. Um, you know, they'll, their, their own legislatures will then uh, put forward the electors, the electors, you know, come to Washington and are counted by the Congress on the 5th. So I think events, the, the transition is moving apace. Um, I think the media is making a little bit more out of um, the, the obstinance of the White House than needs to be made up because it makes a good story and gets people wondering about it. But the, the mechanisms of uh, transition you know, are working, you know, you know, true President Trump hasn't turned over the GSA keys, the General Services Administration's keys to the transition and handed over the nine million dollars or so to the Biden campaign to help him transition. But I, I don't see that Biden is stopping the transition. Uh, a number of Republican senators and House members are uh, calling that uh, Biden should start getting the daily um, intelligence brief and I think that's I think that's probably happening yeah now I mean and then also the transition for Biden is probably going to be one of the easier transitions um, there's ever been because Biden's been here for 50 years he was vice president for eight years uh, he has a whole cadre of people who you know have been recently in government it's not like they're going to have to get um, their backgrounds completely done they just have to be re up and, you know, a lot of the people that it, he's probably going to bring into government already have clearances because they've had clearances in the past. And uh, if you've been in um, government at certain levels, you're able to keep your clearance and it's updated just routinely anyway. So I, I don't think there's going to be some dramatic moment where um, some um, unexpected something happens to um, have to facilitate this transition. Great, and Larissa, your view? I would that? agree with my colleague. Um, I, you know, Biden's known in town. Um, there's certainly a lot of people uh, left in the agencies who are happy to see Trump go. Um, so they, um, they will work extra hard to make sure the transition works. Um, I'm sure there are probably private donors who are putting up the money right now to pay for the transition costs, given that the monies that are set aside in the federal budget 
aren't being, uh, the purse strings aren't being opened by Trump right now, but at some point that will change. Um, it's become pretty clear that it's not a 500 vote difference in Florida like it was in the Gore campaign and we faced then, um, that many of the states will be in the Biden uh, uh, column um, by the time, you know, by the 1st of December or what have you, and the electors will go and they will elect and, you know, and everything will happen. So our government will move forward. It has a seasoned hand there. It's called Joe Biden. Um, people in Washington want to help that transition. Uh, they want to move forward. They want to get beyond the Trump years. So I think that will all happen. Uh, there are two places I think that uh, I see difficulty, if anything. The first is a lot of people left the federal government. I'm talking about civil servants because they did not like Trump. And it just so happened that we, we kept a lot of our federal um, employees longer than normal. In other words, they, they, stood, they st stuck around an extra decade and now they're really old and they gotta get out or they just got out. Um, so we, we have a lot of civil servant positions that don't have people in them and so the, you know, that will need to be worked out over the next few years to actually fill those positions with the bureaucracy, if you will, because we need them. Um, so that's sort of one of the holes in our government that, uh, that we need to fix. The political appointees will happen and that's just what will happen. Um, so that's one thing that concerns me. And the second thing that concerns me in the transition is just the attitude and what Trump really does. When does he finally say enough is enough, I'm going away. And I think that's going to be beholden on a lot of Republicans who can get to him and to say it's enough, it's enough, it's time for you to do your swan song and get out of the way. And um, that's really not in Democrats' hands. It's much more in, um, in, in the members of Congress and Mitch McConnell and others who can, you know, just tell him, okay, it's enough time. It's enough time. Stop already. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, next we have a question from Blarina Hashani. So, Blarina, if you'd like to ask your question, please. Hiya, um, thanks so much. Um, I was just wondering, I mean, I, I'm really curious because we have a sort of a similar situation here in the United Kingdom with the Labour Party and, you know, the splits with the left and with the moderate. Um, so my question really is, you know, do you think that there is a risk if Biden were to sideline progressives like Warren and Sanders, but also the younger generation like AOC? Um, you know, if he does sideline them, you know, will this lead to more apathy and a resentment in the Dems, which could ultimately backfire? But also, the other element is also that, do you think Joe Biden will listen to Kamala Harris on this? Because she's being billed as someone who's more in touch with the young, you know, Democrat base. Um, so do you think that she'll have some sort of influence there when he's thinking about these choices? Thank you. Well, I... Um... I, I think it's going to be dependent on <clears throat> that Georgia race and if Republicans could take control of the Senate. Then I think that there's a lot more cover, if you will, for Biden to be to govern from the middle. And I think America wants to be governed from the middle. I think we need to step back and say, okay, whatever happened in the last four years, let's just move on from that and let's get back to a normal sort of course. And by and large, most Americans, believe it or not, are really more towards the middle on most things than, 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 the, than the screamers that you're seeing on both sides right now. So part of it will be you know, the control of the Senate. And, um, and another part will be again that uh, because the Senate will be so close you won't, I don't think we'll see Elizabeth or, or Bernie there. That doesn't mean that um, he won't take, that Biden won't take people for his cabinet and his undersecretaries, et cetera, from some of the progressive 
pieces of the party, certain from some of the progressive labor movements, from the teachers. I mean, we're gonna say very progressive uh, K through 12 teacher uh, or head of an organization of teachers probably as our education secretary. Um, so you'll see, you'll, you'll see the cabinet populated with some progressives and you'll see um, certainly the undersecretary and the assistant secretary positions populated enough by the progressives. I think he's gonna be very even handed in that. He's not gonna say, no, I, I'm just governing from the middle or no, that's just not me. I think he will. And with respect to Kamala Harris, um, you know, I know her well because I ran against her for the Senate in the United States, for California and lost. Um, it was a two Democrats race. And um, she really, she, no one really knows what she really stands for. And that was borne out in the presidential um, debates and the presidential race where she was one of the first to drop out. She didn't even get on a ballot anywhere because she could not convince America what she was about. So I think she's a very uh, bland canvas and uh, it will take time to see what, um, what, she, what she stands for, what she will do. And I think Biden's people are pretty straightforward about where they want to be. So I, I see more Biden's people giving Kamala tasks to do rather than the other way around of Kamala saying, oh, we need to do this, we need to do that, and Biden's people moving in that direction. I think Biden will be more liberal than he normally would have, um, not more liberal, more progressive in some areas than he normally would have been. But I still think he understands that people want our government to hew towards the center rather to, than to an extreme either way. And George, what's your opinion on the question? Yeah, so I think you can look to Biden to think like a legislator. And um, so as a legislator, you know, you get in there and you say, all right, let's figure out what we can get done. Uh, maybe it's some small ball items, the, um, some things we can find some consensus on. And, you know, let's, let's get out of the blocks and get a few things done um, and see where we are. And then he'll try to um, move on to tackling, you know, some bigger things. Um, yeah, you know, that's how a legislator, I think, would think. And, you know, he spent, um, you know, all those years in the United States Senate. And um, that's, that's what he's going to think. Uh, the, you know, we'll start out with a COVID relief package that I think will get negotiated. And he can take credit for that. And the Republicans can take credit for that. Uh, we've got the government uh, appropriation bills. Um, you know, we still have to fund the government every year and the funding runs out here shortly. I can't remember which, how long the last extension we did, but it's um, certainly before the end of the year. And uh, we'll probably do another extension into the first part of next year. So I don't have to work on that. And so I think he'll move incrementally and um, not try to set out you know, a big progressive agenda to start with where he knows is going nowhere, because if he fails at some big things at the beginning, it's going to make it more difficult to get anything done uh, going forward. Yeah, really interesting um, piece for both of you. Um, okay, next, can we ask um, Elizabeth Grant, please, to answer her question, to ask her question? Even. Yes, of course. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, can you? Hear me? Yeah. Oh, great. Okay. So, uh, so some good news really, um, regarding the Native uh, American uh, tribes. Uh, essentially, they, they elected a record six Native American representatives to the House and some Indigenous locals. Um, the other thing that seems to have been very positive is that they got 116% increase on the vote. Uh, that they got out. Most of that was pro Biden. Um, so, is it time, do you think, for there to be uh, a Native, Native American represented on the cabinet? And if so, what position might they hold, say, interior or something like that? Well, I, um, I, um, I, I don't. Uh, you know, I really have a hard time sometimes saying that, you know, there has to be this or there has to be that on the cabinet. I mean, we do it all the time, but 
I, you know, I served in the Congress, and by the way, and when I did my DNA test, I am 30% American Indian, um, the highest proportion of anything that I am. And, um, you know, but I think there are a lot of Americans like me that have a lot of, um, of if you will, DNA of Native American. But, but I, I, so I think it's interesting to see that we have people coming in who are now labeling themselves saying, yes, you know, I, I am a, a Native American. Um, I've never, uh, and I've shared with several, we've had several in the, in the house and I never looked at them and said, oh, you're the Native American guy. So um, I don't know that, that that's the way that Biden is gonna put his cabinet in, but I think it, it would be nice to see um, someone with maybe who has lived more of what the Native American life is. Let's say someone who does understand living on the reservation or someone who does understand um, the cultural implications of keeping the language alive and everything. Someone who has significantly lived that life. It would be interesting. It would be nice to have them on the cabinet. Uh, certainly it may, uh, I don't know that they would put it on the interior. It seems like that would be a, a great place to marry marry them but remember that the interior has such a control over um euro lands and indian affairs etc that um biden might have a hard time with people pushing back saying no we can't you know we we don't really know how that person will react on the indian issues if you will but i i think we'll see someone on the cabinet probably who who just reflect um, the Native American experience. And I think that would be good for our country. And um, George, what's your view? Yeah, so I, I think Loretta is spot on on a lot of what she said. The, um, you know, the Native American population in America is, um, they really have a tough plight. Uh, I've visited a number of reservations uh, around the country um, over the years, not only as a member of Congress, but as a United States attorney as well. And um, the rate of um, health problems on reservations, the amount of um, crime on, on reservations, addiction problems on reservations, it's really, really quite shocking when you look at the numbers. And uh, the, the United States government has has not fulfilled all the promises that were made to Native Americans. Um, that's an absolute certainty. Uh, the Native American Native Americans have sued the government um, a number of times and have been successful uh, for lapses of the fiduciary responsibility that the the government owes to the Native American population. And so I'm, I'm very glad that they're more engaged in the electoral process. Uh, because, um, you know, that's, that usually gets politicians' attention. Um, so I think that's a good thing. Whether there'll be a Native American in the cabinet, I, I don't know, but it is time. And this, this, is, this is something that's shared by Republicans, and as, as with Democrats, so people who understand this problem, who see this problem, uh, there's, there's a true belief that, um, you know, we need to do something to help these communities um, because, uh, you know, COVID is impacting them disproportionately, as is diabetes, health pro um, heart problems. Um, it's, it's really a tragic situation. So uh, if, if uh, the Biden administration can make uh, leaps forward in progress of addressing this, I think that'd be a very, very good thing. And, and I guess I just also would add, um, Sometimes what a state does and the state government does with respect to Indian reservations and the Indian population, the Native American population um, has a much, much bigger impact um, than what the federal government is doing. Certainly if we did some real overhaul at the federal level and especially with respect to health and education would be really great. But from an economic perspective, um, I have seen so many more tribes when they're economically doing well um, because of the compacts and other issues that they have with the state of California or state of New Mexico or what have you, um, then they have enough money to address some of these very uh, important issues that George spoke about. 
Thank you both for those insights. I think it was a very um, thorough response to the question. Um, so to viewers out there, make, make sure that you're getting your questions in before we um, finish. We've got about 20 minutes left. Um, I'm going to ask a question from um, J. David Morgan, who doesn't ha who uh, has problems with his mic, so he can't read it out for himself. Um, and he asks, uh, with, in view of the issues arising when a sitting president apparently refuses to accept the results, do you think that there are any constitutional, constitutional or legal changes which could be made to change to change the situation and prevent it from occurring in the future? Um, so, the Constitution specifies that the president's term ends on January twentieth. Full stop. Um, so, the the Constitution already provides for you know when the term ends. Um, you know, the electors will come to Washington and meet. Um, the Congress will um, accept the electors and count the electors, tally them, uh, I think is the, the uh, official term. And that is that. So the Constitution already, you know, foresees, you know, how you determine an election. And, you know, we're just, we've just kind of been lulled into this um, thought that you know, when the networks call an election, that the election is called and that's what it is. The Constitution actually spells out a, a process of how this goes through, you know, perhaps anticipating, you know, close elections and contested elections. Um, you know, the founding fathers were, were pretty wise in this. So I think they anticipated that you would have elections that were hard fought and somewhat contested. And that's why we have this very formal process of the state legislature sending their electors to Washington in person, um, you know, to be counted. And, uh, and we'll go through that. And you know, if the electors are disputed, um, you know, the, the Congress debates that and votes on that. And, um, uh, you know, I, I just, I don't think that we need to change anything in the constitution. We just need to let it play out. And just because we haven't seen it play out in its full in our lifetimes or the lifetimes of our parents or grandparents uh, doesn't mean it doesn't work. Thanks, George. And Larissa, what do you think? I, I agree with what George said. I mean, I am not so worried that somehow Trump is this dictator that's gonna hold on to the seat and use the military to put tanks on our streets and you know, hold himself up in the, in the White House and, and that that's gonna happen. I, I just don't see that happening. I think he's having a hard time coming to grips with his loss. And so he's sort of in a malaise of that and he's hoping beyond all hope that somehow things can be turned around in the courts and we can all see this, you know, we can, most people who understand this process understand that that's not really going to happen. So I think he's got to go through this kind of loss sort of situation. And then he's going to say, well, I'm president until the 20th of January. So what is it that I can do? You know, what do I want to do with my last two months of hanging out in this Oval Office? And I think we're going to see a lot of executive directors fly left and right. And, you know, he's going to, you know, sort of try to do his last hurrah and you know the other day the other day my husband said to me again you know we voted for Trump he said you know Trump already said that he's not going to attend the inauguration of of Trump of uh, Biden and I sort of laughed I said well the former president never does that I mean the former president a, 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 as the new president is being sworn in on the steps of our capital of our capital the former president is getting on uh, you know, a helicopter to be flown away from the White House. That's just the way it happens. So I think that's what's going to happen. And, um, and, and I, I'm, I'm not worried about it. I think that I, I believe that we're going to have that transition of power. It's just, it's just taking a little bit longer because of the counting of the votes, because of the lawsuits all within, um, you know, within the letter of the law and everything. And that you know, when the time comes, time comes for everything to play out, as George said, it will. And, you know, Biden will take the White House at noon on the 20th of January, as every president does. Yeah, well, I hope you're right. And I, I'm sure we'll all be watching in the run up to that point and, and watching very intently when we um, do have the inauguration. 
Um, the next question I'd uh, like to have asked is by Emily Cunning. And she has a, a, a question about um, foreign policy. Emily. Hi, um, my question is, uh, who do you think Biden may appoint as Secretary of State? And uh, how will US foreign policy change come next January, both in regards to Biden's actions and how Congress responds to this change in foreign policy, if there will be a change? Well, Biden spent a lot of time as a senator in foreign policy. If you would ask me what Biden would say about what was his specialty, it would be you would believe that he understands foreign policy quite well. So um, he will want somebody who is in sync with him on foreign policy issues. Um, I could see someone like a, um, oh gosh, now I'm blanking on her name. Um, the UN ambassador. Samantha Power. Obama. Rice. Rice? No. Yes. Samantha Power or? Um, no, Suzanne. no. Suzanne uh, Rice. Yeah, yeah. I, I, he had a very good relationship with her. Um, I think that Biden doesn't have a problem putting an Anglo male in that position if he believes that the per he's going to be looking for someone who knows as much as he does in foreign policy, who has the relationships around the world. So, um, you, you know, it could be Coons, Senator Coons. But again, uh, you know, that puts the Senate into play more, more than he may want. So um, I, I, think, um, I, I think he wants a partner. He wants a partner that he can trust that so that they, you know, he, he almost wants like a mini clone of himself running around and helping to uh, get other countries back on the same page with America in a positive uh, relationship and agenda forward. Yeah, I, I would, I would agree with that. The, um, you know, Suzanne Rice, Samantha Power, Tony Blinken, um, uh, Senator Coons would be would be a natural choice because um, uh, obviously uh, Biden knows Coons very well. Um, they've worked together, um, and you know as far as it would be nice if uh, you know the Congress always always meddles in foreign policy, but it's it's been pretty uh, vociferous in the last two administrations. Um, yeah, you know, it used to be that politics stopped in the United States at the water's edge. And, you know, it, a lot of deference to the, the president's running of foreign policy, um, really in his province. Um, and I, hopefully we'll get more back to that. And I don't see, um, you know, the changes in foreign policy that have been touted in the Trump administration have been in the works for a long time. Um, you know, America is becoming a more populous nation. Uh, that's a strain going through not only Republican politics, but through Democrat politics as well. And it's going through, you know, a lot of, of countries around the world. And uh, Trump's foreign policy has reflected that. And you know, I think it's going to be reflected to some extent in Biden's foreign policy as well. Um, you know, a lot of the progressive, um, a lot of the progressive agenda is somewhat populist in nature when it comes to foreign policy and, uh, and the trade agenda. Uh, Trump's trade agenda looks a lot more like a Democrat trade agenda than a Republican trade agenda. You know, Republicans are always the free traders, um, you know, no tariffs. Um, so I, I think you might see more similarities in, in Biden's foreign policy and trade policy uh, with the Trump administration than one might expect, you know, just from knee jerk reaction. Yeah, thank you both. Um, I'm going to uh, use chair's privilege and ask you something which I think is on a lot of people's minds, which is, was Trump an aberration within the GOP or is the GOP now a populist party and even a Trumpist party? Um, what, what do you think of that idea? Um, so, 
I, I think uh, aberration isn't the right word, probably manifestation of things that are, are going on in our politics across the nation. Um, in 2016, I, there are like 20 some odd Republicans running for president in that primary. And each one of them was trying to capture this, this populist movement uh, that started over a decade ago. And um, Trump just happened to jump in there and, and catch the currents just right and say the right things. Um, uh, I think it's been pretty well proven over the last four years, there can be only one Trump. Um, politicians who've gone out there and tried to mimic Trump, uh, you know, usually have not done very well. Uh, so I don't, I don't think Trumpism necessarily survives in our politics, but I do think populism does. Um, and populism can, is, a, is a dangerous current, and it is running wide and running deep. Uh, so I think the next person who capitalizes on that will hopefully um, tame it in such a way that he, addresses, he or she addresses the issues and addresses the, the concerns that the American people have, but don't um, abuse it in such a way as to cause the problems that we that some of us have seen. I, uh, I think Trumpism has had its time. I believe what my colleague George said, um, that is about, you know, the popular sentiment out there and that people are trying to capture that. I think that continues forward, both on the left and the right side of our politics. Um, it's, it's, uh, it, it, it's interesting to note that um, I believe the parties um, had their role uh, in politics before. You know, they would sort of control the information, control the message, and control, and, and control the funders, the donors, if you will. And so when they would run their primaries, they would sort of vet their people out and they would make sure that the person they put forward was somebody who would follow um, the party platform, if you will. And yes, the platform would change over time because at the grassroots level, the party would have its infusion of lefties or righties or people who wanted change, etc. And so the platform would change, but it wouldn't be this radical swing in, in a direction. I, th I think one of the interesting things that's happening in America is I wonder whether the parties really have, uh, have a, a, in the long run, have a play in, in politics. Because if you, if you can get someone like a Trump who was outside of the party structure, could get his own money, could do his own thing, could say his own stuff, could get the populace with him, could get that, and could be the standard bearer for the Republican party. Or if you had a Bernie, I mean, you know, I, I served with Bernie for many years in the House of Representatives and every Democratic caucus, he would stand up and he would rail against all of us about how we weren't moving fast enough and we were sellouts on every and any issue. And we would all look at each other and go, oh my gosh, here's Bernie again. And you know, <laughs> and out of nowhere he runs and he ignites the young people and he ignites this grassroots. And because of the new platforms for money raising, he raised the money to be able to, um, to compete, if you will. And the Democratic Party couldn't rein him in. And you know, and I see the same thing going on with an AOC or any of these people who can raise now millions of dollars on a platform that has nothing to do really with the party. And so, you know, my bigger question is, well, what's the role of the parties these days? If people can essentially go outside of the party and see themselves be successful, then, you know, then, then how will the parties have to change in order to uh, be significant to the political process now. So I, I think Loretta, you're exactly right on that. The, you know, there used to be a time when if you were the, the party endorsed candidate, the, um, you know, that was a, really something to look, look to. Um, today, uh, if you're the party endorsed candidate, a lot of the grassroots at you, looks at you as suspect. <laughs> 
Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and I think those are excellent insights actually from the, the both of you. Um, the next question is from Lorena again, so hopefully we can go to, um, to her. Hi, thanks for giving me another question. Um, so uh, the question I'd like to ask is um, about the sort of UK and US relationship. Um, I'd just be really keen to hear your thoughts about what you think the Biden presidency means for the, for the relationship. And as you obviously are probably aware, we're going through Brexit at the moment. Um, which Mr Biden doesn't approve of, um, but also our Prime Minister Boris Johnson has said in the past some unsavoury things about President Obama, which apparently Biden's camp are very unhappy about. At the same time, Biden called um, Boris Johnson, one, you know, in, in one of the first calls to a European leader. Um, so, you know, what does this mean? What, in your view, do you think this means? Is he a pragmatic or is there going to be a trade deal or is there not? What do you think? I, I believe there's going to be everything. I believe that Joe Biden believes that the UK-US relationship is incredibly important. We need to get it back on track, um, regardless of who's at the helm um, in, in there. And um, he will do everything and he will put the resources and he cares about what's going on in the UK. I think that he also cares about the transatlantic relationship with all of Europe and that he will work, he will put his best people to work on that and to, um, to, to solve, to, 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 re, to address any of the damage that may have been done over the last four years and to really put a strong foot forward together. I, I, I was on the transatlantic dialogue for many years in the Congress. I was the voting member for the NATO parliamentary group from the US. So I spent a lot of time. Um, I spent a lot of time on military and NATO issues with Europe and the UK. Um, and uh, I just believe that Biden will be very, he, I think that that's one of the more basic things he wants to do is to ensure that Europe is strong, to ensure that the UK is strong, and to ensure that together we are all strong as we move forward to face some very big issues, a, a China encroaching on other Asian countries, a China buying up many of the world's rare, rare metals and other um, uh, commodities for the future, uh, a Putin who wants to restore, I think, I believe, I could be wrong, hit the glory of Russia to the boundaries of what used to be the USSR, um, a, you know, a, a Middle East, a, an Africa popping with things to, to happen, a South America that's um, that's still, you know, agricultural and not really developing as fast as, you know, would behoove the rest of the country. And of course, other overarching issues like climate change, which affects all of us and we're all in this together. So when I look at Biden, I think he wants to be a strong leader. He wants the U.S. to be a strong leader. He needs our allies to be not ahead of him, not behind us, by, but his, by his side, by our side, as we move forward to, um, to greater good for our planet. I think that's where he's going to come from. Thanks, Loretta. And if I could briefly come to you as we're about to... Um, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I, I, agree, I agree with Loretta. The support of the special relationship between the United States and the United Kingdom is bipartisan. I've been the longtime chairman of the British American Parliamentary Group, which are 12 members appointed by the speaker to kind of shepherd the parliamentary relationship. I also chair the UK caucus, which is a broader group of a bipartisan group. Um, so I, I don't have any concerns about the special relationship between our two countries. And I think we'll get to a trade agreement. I think most of the trade agreement will be hammered out by the end of the year. And uh, I think as soon as, um, uh, President Biden gets a trade representative confirmed in the Senate. It'll be, you know, on the on the to do list, pretty high up there uh, because it'll be mostly done, and it'll be one of those, you know, kind of near term wins that a Biden administration can have uh, working across the aisle. So I, I don't think we're in any danger of um, the special relationship being 
uh, undermined in any way. Excellent. Thank you so much um, for those comments. And thank you both for this really fascinating discussion. I think our participants enjoyed it as well. And we had some great questions. Um, so, Cara, if I can pass over to you to wrap this up. Thank you so much, Joe, And thank you, obviously, to Loretta and George. Uh, that was a really fantastic discussion. I'm very sorry uh, to Emma Long and Dolores Rosano, who are our two outstanding questions that we didn't get to. Um, they were both very interesting questions about the uh, kind of Biden-McConnell relationship. So I'm, I'm pretty sure we'll have some reflections on that come the next uh, the next uh, meeting of the, the uh, American Politics Colloquium. So once again, I just want to say thank you very much to everyone um, for coming along today and uh, to our contributors, uh, George and Loretta, and also um, Professor Candace Nelson, who spoke to us at the beginning, and obviously to Joe Harmon and Laura Smith for some really fantastic uh, chairing. I think by and large, we made the technology work, which is good. Um, and thank you very much um, to Phil and Andy in their role as co-chairs of the APG for um, putting this this event together uh, with me. It's been a pleasure as always. Um, so thank you so much to everybody. And um, I'm going to close us out now. And I hope you have a lovely evening or morning, wherever you are. Um, and we will hopefully see you all soon. So thanks very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.